ahead. So hello everyone and welcome to our first uh, Can't Around the World uh, seminar. Uh, the idea behind the, the seminar that we're doing for the first time in the summer is that we wanted to bring our worldwide uh, community, transportation community together and provide some sort of a platform where we can exchange ideas and expertise. Uh, for, for this uh, seminar during the summer, we're going to be having uh, 10 speakers. And as you can see now, I'm sharing my screen. You can see the 10 speakers that we're going to be having this semester. Uh, we are very excited about them. They are top-notch people in our field. And we hope that you guys will also enjoy uh, the, the selection. Uh, moving to today's presentation, uh, I have the great pleasure of introducing Professor Stein uh, as today's uh, Kent Around the World speaker. Professor Stein is one of the South Africa's top pavement researchers. He's currently a professor and the head of the CE department. Uh, he led the planning and the construction of a magnificent state-of-the-art pavement research lab at his institution, and this is uh, approved by professor. Um, uh, uh, Besides, uh, he is an adjunct professor at Chang'an and Shandong Universities in China, and he's also an editor uh, of uh, IGPE. Uh, his research interests include uh, pavement vehicle interaction, accelerate pavement testing, and uh, pavement engineering and materials. Uh, today, he will be discussing the impact of pavement research on our livelihoods from the most basic to the most advanced ways. Please note that there will be no questions during the presentation. All of the questions will be at the end of the lecture. Uh, we're going to have a small Q&A session where you can leave either your question in the chat or you can raise your hand. And the way that you do it is you go to, to participant uh, and then you raise your hand or you add your question to the chat and I'll be reading it. Uh, to Professor Stein. Uh, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Stein. Thank you very much, Isaac. I really appreciate and uh, it's really a privilege to be part of the uh, Kent seminar series. Uh, I just want to get my screen up for you and uh, I think it's up and running there and get to start the presentation. There we are. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Good morning to the, to the people in the US. Um, and thank you for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. And I trust that you will gain something from the seminar this afternoon. Um, the topic of the seminar uh, is 7.8 billion customers who benefits from my research. And as you will see during the discussion, I decided to, to focus a bit slightly different way on pavement engineering and road engineering. And I trust that it will provide you with a bit of a different insight in the job that you do on a daily basis, in your studies uh, and in your career that lies ahead. So let's start with a good question. Why are roads important? Uh, you guys are all working with roads. You are interested in pavements. Um, and as, as somebody that lives in the 21st century, uh, if you've got a question, my children tells me, ask Google. So if you ask Google, it tells you on why I wrote important that there's 292 million results. Uh, that doesn't help us much. So if we ask for the visuals of that, you start to see a lot of pictures. And on the pictures, you see things like the following. Uh, you see, I just want to get a laser pointer there. Uh, you see people, you see roads, you see road safety issues and so on. And you start to realize that there's, there's a few pictures that you start to see over and over again. But the important part is why are roads important? In my view, roads are important because of people. If we did not have people, we did not need roads. Um, so that is why the seminar focuses on your 7.8 billion customers. So let's, let's look a bit more detail. 7.8 billion people on earth. We've got about 64 million kilometers of roads on earth. If you do the quick calculation, that's 121 kilometers per person if everything was equally distributed, which unfortunately is not the case. And I don't think you need to be convinced that roads are essential for your livelihood. Roads connect, and it connects in terms of social, economic, commercial, safety opportunities, and various others. And quite importantly, because roads connect, roads also enable your functioning 
as a human being. You need roads to function. So as pavement engineers and researchers, it's important that we focus on keeping the wheels rolling as the foundation of improving the livelihood of pretty much each of those 7.8 billion people on earth. Even the ones that uh, live on boats, the ones uh, mainly making use of rail uh, and so on, somewhere in their lives, they need a road to connect some points. And that's why roads are important. Okay, so in this big picture, when we say that civil engineers, pavement engineers enable people's lives, we need to create and maintain the facilities that actually improve quality of life. And, and that's not only for us as pavement engineers, it's also the structural guys, it's the water guys, it's the duty guys. Whatever we are doing, the focus is there to improve quality of life of people. And that's quite an important aspect of what we are busy with. And to link to that, this is something that I just thought about last week. All of you in terms of your research has got a client, the roads department or somebody that pays for, for the work that you are involved in. But I think it's important to understand that that entity that pays, in my view at least, is, is not really your client. The road users are your clients. So whether you are doing work on calculating stresses and strains and surface energy or whatever, on a very small part of a material somewhere in a road. It's important to sit back now and then and decide for yourself, why is this important? And it's not important because your roads department needs the answer. It's important because your roads department who funds your research is going to use this data to hopefully improve the way that they provide roads, that they maintain roads, that they rehabilitate roads for the person that actually uses that road in the end. So if you look at this and you look at each of these little persons, that one on the motorbike, that one in the taxi, all of these standing on the highway, that one walking, that lady carrying water, uh, that guy in his donkey cart, those guys are your actual customers. Those are the people why you are doing your job. And in doing this job, um, there's two parts of providing roads that's important to understand and that's the those are the terms accessibility and mobility and there are very different definitions for them if you go and search for it uh, but i think it boils down to the following accessibility looks at the ability to reach opportunities so accessibility tells me is there any way of traveling from point a to point b whether it's a gravel track or a highway, it doesn't matter, can I reach the opportunity? While mobility looks at the efficient movement of people and goods. How can I uh, ensure people to travel faster and in a better way, a better system of carrying the transportation? So, so on the one hand, they are not exactly the same goal because the one says, I don't really worry too much how efficient it is as long as I can and travel and the other ones say yeah i know i can travel but i need to do it in a more cost effective way so that's why they are sort of two parts of of the picture that we are looking at and very specifically in in the middle of the seminar presentation uh, there's two examples of some of the work that we are involved in that i think that highlights and support these two ideas of accessibility and mobility and now both of them actually reaches your customer, your 7.8 billion people on the ground. So another principle that's quite interesting, and this partly talks to the, the professors and the lecturers and so on, uh, but, but as students, it's important to understand it, I think. Uh, you may know a guy named Janus. Um, Janus is, was the Roman mythological god of beginnings and ends. Uh, and what's quite important about Janus is he was this god with two faces looking in two directions. So again, there's many definitions looking at the past, looking at the future, looking at uh, entrance, looking at exit and so on. And this is one of the depictions that you can see of him. And I decided that uh, from, a, from an engineering viewpoint, uh, Janus should actually look slightly different. And, and this is my interpretation of why it's important to understand this Janus principle of everything having two sides. 
On the left-hand side, you can see, well, for many of you, uh, Prof. Imat will understand what's on the left-hand side with the slide rule. Some of us, it's, it's something that we know of. Most of you guys will understand the right-hand side much better with the Janus has got a VR uh, pair of glasses on. Why is this important for us? Because of the following. If you look on the left-hand side, um, you can look at things like accessibility, just sort of being able to get to the opportunity, basic engineering principles, our traditional and fundamental requirements for training, education, and research. If you want to become an engineer, you need to know that one plus one is two. And in our training of engineers, that's why I say it's partly for the, for the lecturers and professors this slide, in our training of engineers, we need to make sure that our future engineers still understand the basics. They still need to understand the basics of soil, of uh, mechanics, of all these principles. And once they understand that, then we get to a world on the right-hand side, which looks more at mobility, advanced analysis, finite element analysis, what we call civil tronics here at our university, and then what I would just call a post-whatever world. And post-whatever, it is virtual reality, it's building information management systems, autonomous vehicles, electrical vehicles, uh, mobility as a service. Post-COVID-19, with a lot of webinars, we just yesterday had our Southern African Transportation Conference webinar looking at what's the impact of COVID-19 in developing countries, for instance. And what's quite important in our teaching and training of future engineers, but also your learning about engineering, is to understand that both these parts are part of your life. You cannot do the advanced analysis if you do not understand the basic math and soil science and so on. And you have to combine these to get to the correct outcome of understanding the basics and the fundamentals and applying those in a way that's beneficial to your clients. And linking to this, um, I thought this morning it's important to make this point that some of you know, may know about the Academy of Pavement Science and Engineering, APSI. Uh, which Imat had a major uh, part in playing in, in putting this together uh, three, four years ago. And the vision of EPSI is to strive to build safe, secure, and sustainable mobility for people and goods through academic excellence. And this can only be done if we ensure that the academic work that we are doing, and whether that is teaching or research, that it is supported by the good fundamental basics. And once we've got that fundamental basics, then we can go to the application. Then we can go to the uh, more high-tech, newer VR, finite element, whatever element analysis and so on. So I think that's important to keep in mind in our discussions. Okay, so as I said, I will cover two examples of a bit more technical information to, to demonstrate a bit about this accessibility mobility issue. So the first example is going to look at nano saline stabilization of in situ materials. And that's more the accessibility, the options to solve accessibility problems for users. And, and you will start to hear, this is accessibility, it's the basic opportunity to link point A to point B. So on the one hand, it sounds like a very simple, yeah, this is gravel roads and so on, but we link it to nanotechnology which is a relatively modern high-tech way of dealing with our materials. And then the second example uh, is one of my uh, pet topics in terms of research, agricultural produce transportation, where we then say, okay, what are the options to affect the agricultural producer, the farmer, as well as the consumer, the 7.8 billion people's lives? And that's more looking at mobility, making the system work better. So let's start with the nano saline as the first option. So why, why is this important? Uh, nano saline treatments of in situ materials. And uh, by the way, in the next few slides, you will see that there's a name uh, or more than one names together with the heading every time. And that's either my colleagues or my postgraduate students that's been involved with me and uh, in groups, in um, research groups in this work. So uh, Prof. Gerrit Jordan is an extraordinary professor um, at my department, and he's, he's quite heavily involved in a lot of these developments. So why is this important? <clears throat> now, if I look at South Africa, 
we've got around 750,000 kilometers of roads in total in the country, of which about 80% is unpaved. That's the 11th longest road network in the world. So a lot of these roads, as I say, unpaved. Unpaved roads has got its own issues. As you see over there, uh, it's dusty when it's uh, dry. So there's a road safety aspect. It's impassable when it's wet. Uh, it becomes very difficult to travel between different uh, locations. And um, together with that, another problem that we've got in South Africa, much bigger than many other countries, is our unemployment issues. Because people battle to get to employment opportunities. But also we look at ways of employing people. And all of this links to this whole accessibility issues. Then recently uh, with some advanced um, socioeconomic work uh, that one of our local economists has done, um, our National Roads Agency identified about 13,000 kilometers of these unpaved roads that are seen as socioeconomically important and that it needs to be improved to a condition that it's a all weather type of, of road. So if you look at all of that and the typical problem where you go to rural areas and it's far from material sources, very often the materials that you find there is marginal quality. So you cannot just use it in a base course. Um, that all start to put together this issue of why nano saline treatment of in situ materials becomes important for us. So another way of looking at that, and this is a study that the World Bank has done, uh, they defined a rural access index. And if you just look at, this is a summary of, of a number of countries and regions that they evaluated. And it's unfortunate that this is the picture, but it's, it's one of the studies that shows it and many of the others confirm it. As the rural access road index drops from 100 down to zero, the poverty incidence increases. And, and this links to something that all of you should know very well, the whole uh, idea of um, good roads supporting a good economy. If you've got good transportation networks, the economy can grow. If you don't have the transportation uh, networks, the economy cannot grow. So it's another reason why this is quite important. Because we've got a short period of time available, I decided to simplify the um, explanation of, of the process of the nano saline treatment. And just by the way, you will see on the, on the second last, last slide, I summarized a number of the references to some of the work that we have done over here. So you're welcome to go and pick up on those references to get the more details about it. But in a simplified process, if you, if you look on the right hand side over here, what happens with these nano saline treatments is that the, the surface of our rock aggregate or soil typically change when we treat it from hydrophilic to hydrophobic uh, condition. And that enables a better attraction between the organic material and the anorganic material. And part of this is also repelling some of the water molecules. Now, I'm not going to explain the chemistry on the right hand side. The reason why I've added that is the important part to get back to the whole Janus principle of understanding the basics. There are chemistry involved. So if you don't like chemistry, it's a good, good spot to start to like it. Because if you do not understand the materials that you're working with, the geological materials, as well as whatever you are treating it with, you have to be very careful because you can easily run into trouble. So that's why the caveat is there. It can be done and it should be done if you accurately identify the combinations of soil and nano saline type of material. And that typically needs a bit more than just a standard CBR or Atterberg test. We typically use X-ray diffractions quite a lot on that. And obviously there you need the specific interpretation to understand what you are measuring and why you are measuring it and so on. But what I wanted to make clear about this is that the high-tech chemistry understanding of the nano material provides us with this opportunity of changing the property of our materials. So, so some of the benefits of this is that we often have materials all over the world that we call non-standard, marginal, low-cost, substandard, whatever the word is. But it basically just says, I cannot use this as a base or a sub-base material. And by treating the right material with the right nano saline, 
you can actually through this better adhesion start to get a material that's relatively water repellent that can provide a stronger bond between the material particles itself and can actually start to solve some of these marginal material problems. And very importantly, another major benefit in terms of, of the treatments are that those figures that I show you there is, is sort of average figures in terms of a traditional pavement, million US dollars per kilometer. And in some of the work that we've done, that typically drops to $250,000 per kilometer. So a quarter of the, of the cost. Going up to half the cost sometimes, but you can see that there's a significant cost difference in terms of a traditional pavement structure and using this. And, and it's mostly because for the traditional pavement structure in these areas, it means that I have to import material from pretty far away. That's starting to become costly. And, and the type of material that I have to import is also costly. So selected benefits of that. Now, as with many things, T's and C's apply. Buyer beware. You cannot just, and you should not just, whatever somebody wants to sell to you as a magic pro product, add that to your soil and expect miracles. If you did not know it before, there are no miracle materials in pavement engineering. If it doesn't make sense on a chemical and a physical and engineering foundation, it's not going to work. So yes, there are things that you have to look at. You have to look at things around the toxicology, the health and safety, because you are working with uh, materials that may sometimes uh, have some health uh, uh, issues, and then you should not use them. You have to look at the environmental aspects because you are mixing in a material with your soil. What's happening if it doesn't bond very well? You've got leaching and going into the groundwater. You have to look at how much you need. You have to look at Simple things like the stability in the carrier fluid. You bring this stuff onto your site. And again, it's not a magic material. If the manufacturer tells you it's stable for six months, don't leave it in the sun for two years and you don't understand why it's not working anymore. You need to understand the compatibility with the mineralogy of your material with the stabilizing agent. Getting back to the chemistry that I spoke about, soil chemistry, uh, chemistry of the material. And then lastly, quite important again, but you need to have a look at the cost aspects. Um, because we have seen cases where uh, it is more cost effective to use just a traditional pavement design for certain specific conditions. So T's and C's applied, make sure that you understand these issues before you use it. Okay, so two specific examples. The one is where we had a look at a, a dolomite that we use in some of our roads, and um, we were wanted to see what are the effects of some of our nanosaline treatments. And this is an example of uh, what it looked like after we treated it. And there you can see sort of the uh, water afterwards. Uh, you've got this beading type of effect on, on the material. And it's, it's a nice photo, but it does not really tell you what's the benefits from a pavement engineering viewpoint. So very specifically, what we've done in this case is uh, we had a neat material, the dolomite, and we had a treated one, and we did various tests on it and so on. But the one that, that really showed us the benefit for our 7.8 billion customers is this one. Here we have done the standard maximum dry density OMC type of, of comparison for our materials. And, and you can see the dotted line over there is the one for the neat material. Um, and I just normalized the OMC that was sort of half a percent from each other. Uh, so we've done the uh, maximum dry density at OMC and minus one and minus 2% and plus one and plus 2%. And you can see the standard uh, density moisture curve. But then when we added the nanosaline treatment, the first part that we had a look at is we were concerned and we said, oops, there's a bit of a drop in the maximum dry density of this material. But when we started to discuss this and evaluate it and see, okay, so, so what, what does it tell us? We started to focus on that part over there, where you've actually got on the minus 2% or, or of OMC, so less water, we actually had an increase of about 2.5 percentage points in our maximum dry density. Now you can say, well, why do you want to do that? It's much better to work there at the higher densities and so on. 
This is important because of this. If you go and calculate the amount of material that you need for a standard two-lane road in a base layer, then that difference means about 40,000 liters of water that you need less if you compact at uh, minus 2% of OMC rather than OMC. And yes, your density is a bit lower, but with the type of strength test that we did on this, we were quite happy that even at minus 2%, we still make the strength requirements for the specific uh, road that we are looking at. And if you come to a country like South Africa, which has got water scarcity, and you go to a community where they don't have enough water and you want to build a road and you can save them 40,000 liters of water for every kilometer that you build. That's got a major impact in the lives of that community. So again, now you start to see how the nanotechnology solution and the chemistry and the everything around that start to affect a on the ground constructing my road using less water option. And that affects the people in the community because they've got a road that is in a good condition, but they also save their water. That's pretty scarce. So one example of, of the importance of, of this nano is This is a road with more track, um, sort of 3 million standard axle design. Uh, and this road was 30, 40 years old. It was in need of rehabilitation. Um, so you can see there on the right hand side, there was a few partners involved in the work, CSIR and the Gauteng provincial government in which area the road lies, as well as Prof. Jordan and his company in the designs. And what you see here on the left hand side, the, the, the conventional ES3 design. That's what our general guideline would tell us. You start with a 40 millimeter asphalt. You need to bring in a, a high quality G1 base material. Now, just in our nomenclature, the G1 material is our best quality granular material, and the classification goes down to a G10 material, which is sort of in situ. We don't use that in a pavement structure. If you get to G7, G8, maybe selected in situ subgrade type of material, but for sure not really part of our pavement structure. So the conventional design set. Let's have a look at uh, 150 G1, 150 millimeter C3, which is a stabilized, cement stabilized layer on top of our selected material. And if we then uh, look at the option that's been seen as the alternative design, you see that there we now look at a option where we use a double seal, which can work very well in this uh, regard. And together with that, we've got this G7, G8 type of material, and for a bit of context, you can see there at the bottom, got a uh, lab CBR of between 10 and 15, um, more than 20% passing the 0 0.075 millimeter surf. Uh, so it's, it's not a good base quality material. But we've done the laboratory tests, we evaluated it, we came up with a solution that looked at between one and one and a half percent of the uh, saline modified emulsion. And in terms of costs, it was a bit over 50% cost saving comparing the alternative to the conventional design. Now you can say, well, that's fine, um, but can it actually do the job? So a few photos from the site. Um, at the bottom right, you can see the type of traffic that drive over there. It's mostly maize trucks and so on, but they are fully loaded. You can see the environment over there. Uh, we constructed the road and then through uh, Gauteng as well as CSIR, we conducted a uh, heavy vehicle simulator test on it. There you can see the quality of the material and you can actually see that there's a lot of fine material in there. This is incidentally, you see over there, these are cores that were drilled out of the road. Now you have to start to think about it. It's a relatively marginal, low quality material that we treated, compacted, finished the road after a month or so we came and we could physically drill out a core. That already is a good thing. Then we started the heavy vehicle simulator test, the APT test, and towards the end of the test we even added surface water to the to the section. And I thought to show you a lot of graphs and I thought sometimes a picture is better than a graph. So on the left hand side you see the cores that we took out before testing started. And on the right hand side, you can see a core that we took out after uh, seven and a half million standard axles. 
And with that seven and a half million standard axles, we had less than 10 millimeter surface rot, even after part of the test was done under wet conditions. So the summary of that is, I think you can start to see that having this really marginal material that we will normally not use inside our pavement structure, by treating it appropriately, by understanding the chemistry and the physics and the geology of it, we actually got a road now for less than half the cost that actually behaves very well. The road is about two years old uh, at this stage, still in a very good condition as, as uh, predicted by our APT testing. So we, we are keeping an eye on it, but we are quite confident that it's gonna work. So this is an example where accessibility, where people don't have access because of marginal materials, low quality materials, and the cost of importing high quality materials where accessibility is supported by our high-tech nanotechnology type of solutions. That's my first example. Now we go to the second one. For the second one, we are going to have a look at agricultural produce transportation. <clears throat> now, for about the last 10 years, uh, we have been involved in various ways in looking at the fundamental question of how our road condition impact on the quality of agricultural produce that's transported from the farm to the market. And um, it took us to very interesting areas. Uh, some of the work initially being having been done in California, a lot of the work having done in South Africa over the last few years. And there you can see my, my students, uh, Lise and Linky and Andre and Tamron, as well as the guys from ZZ2, uh, we supported various parts of this. So the first question that I'm looking at is how can the road condition be optimized to ensure that a tomato or an avocado, because those are the two that we really focused on in this study so far, but it can be various other products, that that tomato or avocado can arrive in the best condition at the consumer. My consumer is my 7.8 billion people sitting out there, they are hungry. They want to buy a tomato and they want to buy a good quality tomato. The farmer is doing his best to produce good quality tomatoes, but then between the farm and the consumer, there's some transportation process. And the major part of that transportation process is often a road. So how can I optimize that part? So the first work that we've done is to say, okay, we know road roughness is going to affect this. So we measured road roughness uh, using a class one profilometer. Then we used various types of sensors to determine the intertomato stresses oh, by measuring in between the two tomatoes as it's being transported on these different routes. We actually determined how much stress they exert on each other. Once you know the stress on the tomatoes, uh, you speak to the agricultural people and they can tell you how much stress will cause bruising of the tomato. And then the outcome of this first part of the work that Linky has done is a set of um, relationships comparing the roughness of the road, IRI, International Roughness Index, with the shelf life of the tomatoes that's been transported on that road. And there's a, a range of these for different uh, ripeness of tomatoes and for the duration of the trip and so on. But essentially it starts to tell us that if you transport your tomatoes in a certain type of vehicle on a road that's got a high roughness, it will have a shorter shelf life. Why is that important? Because if you as a consumer buy this tomato and after two days it starts to look bad because of a bruising, I'm for sure not going to buy that same producer's tomatoes anymore. That's why it's important. So the guidance that the producer gets from this is to where the, the farmer is in control of the roads to know what is the level of road roughness that I should aim for on my gravel road, specifically in this case, to ensure that I can optimize my shelf life. So that was the first outcome. Then the next question that we said is, when should what be maintained? Because right now we know that we have to maintain these gravel roads, but when should it be maintained and which portion to ensure optimal cost and condition? So in this regard, this is work that then we then continued with. We monitored the road roughness using 
a response type road roughness measuring system. That's just a very long acronym to indicate that we had accelerometers calibrated on a vehicle, obviously with specific type of suspension and so on. This vehicle drives on the road, it's calibrated, and from this data, we can get an indication from the vertical accelerations, what the riding quality is of that section of road. So by using the farm vehicles that's instrumented, that's doing their normal driving on the roads, the moment they get back to the office, you can see where are the bad spots on the road. Identified there on the map, and now the maintenance effort can be focused because now the grader only needs to go back to those specific sections, which did a cost saving at one stage when we calculated of between 40 and 60% on the blading cost. So now you start to save time and money for the owner of the road, the farmer in this case, but it can also be the, uh, the government agency that, that looks after these roads. So that was the next step. How do we continuously know what to maintain and where to maintain? The next thing that we said, we are living in a fourth industrial revolution era. So how can 4IR contribute to the solution? And there, some of the work that Elisa has done became quite important because we said, okay, if we can now connect this intelligent vehicle, which is actually just a vehicle with accelerometers on it, that continuously monitors the road condition. Once that vehicle gets back to head office, it reports to a central repository, which basically just says it downloads the data. You do the autonomous analysis of this data and you can immediately in this reports, like the previous slide, see where's the bad spots on the roads. The maintenance unit can receive this report. They've got a basically automated decision regarding the maintenance need because they've got a guidance that says to keep the tomatoes in this condition, we have to maintain the roads at a riding quality of better than uh, six, for instance. So this section of the road is worth go out and grade it. So that gives the guidance to the grader to say which section you have to look at. Does the grading and we've got GPS on the grader. So the grader can report back that they actually worked on that section. And the next vehicle that travels on that section reports back again and tells me, is the road now in an acceptable condition? So we are at what I would like to call an almost autonomous road maintenance. One day in the not too distant future, because it's sort of possible already, you can have an autonomous vehicle monitoring the road, telling an autonomous grader to go and grade the road, and the autonomous uh, vehicle that drives on it next will tell you this was a good job. So, but a four IR into the equation. Then the next question that we asked is, how can deterioration data of my road contribute to my maintenance decision? Because it's good and well to measure today that there's a bad spot on the road and I go and do something about it. But actually I need to budget for these things. Uh, and to budget, I need information. So part of the work that Tamron did then was to develop regression models using real response type road roughness measurement data together with the maintenance history of ZZ2 in this case, the historical rainfall data, put them together and develop deterioration models where the effect of wet and dry seasons, low and high slopes, because it's, it's quite mountainous areas, some of these, so whether you're on a flat road like this one or a mountainous one plays a role, as well as low and high traffic volumes, because some of these roads only have the farm traffic and others have a lot more traffic. So the deterioration model put them together and say, now I can start to budget for the next year because I've got an expectation of how the environment and location and materials and traffic will actually affect the deterioration of my roads. So a nice step forward. Quite important over here, if you do go and have a look at the paper, please don't just download the equation and say, well, now I can do it in my area also, because it is very much dependent on local conditions. Your rainfall, your materials, your traffic levels, your slopes of your roads and so on, as with everything that we are working in pavement engineering, those local conditions are important. Okay, but now we've got our models. Next question. Now we get more to the management side. How can my... How the pavement engineers work can make life better for the consumer. 
So, so the work that Tamron has done, in the end, this is one of the major conclusions. We combined the uh, One option of minimizing the grading cost because you don't have to keep the roads at the same level of riding quality. On the other hand, if you've got an objective of maximizing your tomato shelf life, low market demand, so people buy tomatoes and they take 10 days to eat them, then you need to guide the farmer to transport different tomatoes and spend more on the maintenance of the roads because you want the road in a better condition. And all of this becomes part of your grading triggers of balancing how much grading do you need? What's the condition that you aim for linking that to the market? So you get to a dynamic maintenance scheduling that governs your maintenance decisions. Then the next question is, is it really always the road that is the problem? Which part of the transportation cycle causes the highest potential damage? And yet in some of the work that Andre has been involved with our smart avocados and smart tomatoes, this is an indication of the cumulative uh, kinetic energy that a avocado experiences firstly when it's handled during harvesting that's the first blue section and you see that there's quite a bit of energy second one when it's transported in a crate without suspension to the loading bay then a section where it's transported on a relatively good paved road a section where it's transported on a gravel road, also a relatively good one, and then what happens in the packhouse with the avocado. And you can see that now you start to be able to identify where's the biggest potential damage in this whole cycle. And you don't spend all your money just fixing the gravel roads. You also say, but maybe we must have a look at that uh, in-field type of experience, and maybe we have to look at the packhouse experience because that's a much big, big a bigger potential damage. And that's where we get to something like, like this, uh, for which I put the interpreter beware, because it's, it's work in progress that we are looking at, but how does the cumulative energy and the total fall distance in the pack house, which is some of the data that we get out of this, indicate to me whether I've got good packing operations or unacceptable packaging operations. So now we know where's the worst parts of the whole transportation cycle. And then the last part is, but can a decision-making model now assist us in this optimization? This is where Kirsten's work, which is currently work in progress, becomes important. She's now looking at developing a Bayesian decision-making model where we start from the field to the consumer. We identify all the aspects that play a role, determine their probabilities of happening, and as well as the effect of each of them on the outcome. And you can see this is just a small snapshot of a much bigger network that she's working on. But now we've got a data-driven, real data from the field model that can guide the user to ensure that whatever is delivered is as good as possible. So that is our example of mobility. Now in conclusion looking at benefits, impacts, knowledge management. I think you will understand by now if I say that road research or engineering is done for all road users, not just for the guy that pays you. The road user, whoever it is, the person carrying the water on a head or transporting tomatoes or driving at high speed on a highway. And the impacts of your work should be significant. And uh, uh, you have to uh, bear with me if I then put in brackets, not only peer-reviewed publications. And, and as Isaac has said, I, I am part of the uh, board of a good journal. Um, so publications are important because we have to share the knowledge, but it should not be your sole purpose in life. You have to think, well, if this publication goes out, this peer-reviewed wow journal paper, how this, will this cause my knowledge to be shared? the benefits to be accrued and real impacts to be made in normal people's lives, because that's why you are working on roads. So the question for you should be, does your research, whatever it is, stresses, strains, finite element, um, whatever the level is, 
does that research enable someone to have an improved social or economical or security or educational opportunity? Does it improve their lives? Because it's only if it improves their lives, somebody's lives, that your work is significant. Otherwise, you spend a lot of effort and resources and so on, and the question is, but so what? So in this whole thing, obviously, you don't do this stuff alone. That's why I said there's a lot of people that helped with this, that supported this in a team effort. And firstly, thanks to University of Illinois, Imat, Isaac, you guys for this opportunity. But then as you've seen, many colleagues and postgraduate students, they do a lot of work in terms of keeping this whole thing alive and come with very good ideas and very good solutions to many things. And then obviously the people with that pays. Yes, I did say they are not your main client or customer, but, but that's important as long as you can show the impact in their lives. So my acknowledgement and my thanks to all of the uh, for supporting this work in various ways. This is a page that uh, you can have a look at later on, on the YouTube version, which, which has got some of the, the publications in terms of the uh, nano saline, as well as some of the um, agricultural transportation. Um, if you need some more information, otherwise you can contact me and we can discuss it. And with that, Isaac, uh, I think I'm pretty much just at 40 minutes. Thank you very much. This is a good shot of our new engineering 4.0 building that we are extremely proud of. Um, and the first link that you will see up there is actually the link to the website. Uh, we have to start populating it now with the actual work that we hope to do in the next month or two, three, but uh, you are welcome to come and have a look. Isaac, thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Tain, for this very nice presentation. It was really inspiring. I really liked it, especially the conclusion and the having an impact on other people's life. This is actually the main purpose of uh, what we do. Uh, so guys, now we can move to questions. If you have any question, please write it either in the chat or raise your hand now. So uh, Professor Tain can answer, uh, can answer your question. Puneet, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Professor. It was really a nice presentation. Uh, we learned a lot. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is, yes. uh, especially with the part of nanosilane, use of nanosilane. So I just wanted to know why we are using nanomaterial specifically. And second, will this work for all types of soils or we need to be cautious with some specific type of uh, inorganic material we are dealing with? Okay, let, let me start with the second part. Um, mm -hmm. It's extremely important that you test your soil uh, and make sure that you've got a chemical compatibility with whichever nano saline you are using. And, and there's a host of these. So that's why I'm not trying to say, okay, this one will work with that and so on. It depends on the, on the um, clay minerals. Mm -hmm. in your soil. Clay minerals plays a major role over there and, and some of them are working and some of them are not working. So it, it is an essential part of it to test before you make that decision. Mm -hmm. The reason why we are looking at the nanomaterials is uh, through various things that we have done, we've started to say, well, a lot of people are talking about nanotechnology and they say it's so good and changing things. But, but what's quite in interesting about your nanomaterials are that because they are less than 100 micron, that's a definition for, for nano, um, or, uh, le yeah, less than 100 nanometer, sorry, that's your nanomaterials. Because they are so fine, you actually get a much better distribution of that material in your mix. So if I, if I simplify it in a bad way, if I've got a one cube, uh, one centimeter by one by one centimeter of material that I want to mix into a, a bowl of soil, mm -hmm. then obviously if I've got that one solid piece, it can yeah. only affect whatever touches its sides, which is very limited. It's a bit stupid. But when I start to grind that down into smaller and smaller and smaller parts, then the the reactive external part of those smaller parts actually increases significantly. And, and mm -hmm. there's, there's one of the papers, there's, there's a nice example of that, but uh, there's very good examples on the internet. If you go and have a look at every time you make those parts smaller, how the surface area increases significantly. 
And the mm -hmm. surface area is the reactive part. And that's why once you get to the nanoscale of those materials, you can, you can uh, treat so much more of your material. Mm -hmm. And that's where a lot of the benefits come from because now you can treat your material on the, on the clay platelet level for instance, and you don't sit with clay as a lump of material, you sit with it as, as the platelets where you treat that. So that, that's a sort of the, the, the simple explanation of, of why we are looking at the nanomaterials. And obviously, if you look at cement, for instance, uh, yeah. the finer the cement, uh, the better reaction uh, normally, and, and the quicker your reaction and so on. And, and it's the same, same basic idea over there. I hope that helps. Thank you, uh, thank Professor Stein, we have a question in the chat. Uh, we're going to go back. We have two, two more questions. But uh, before that, there is uh, Danny asked a question on, on the group chat. He asked uh, two questions, actually. He asked yes. about what is the typical resilient modulus for a nano silane uh, treated base? And he also asked uh, during construction, did nano silane reduce the optimum moisture content of the soil? And if so, how much? OK. Um, I'm not going to give you a number on the uh, typical uh, resilient modulus because it totally depends on your uh, uh, parent material. But what the way I'll, I'll answer it is that it is acceptable if it's the correct material to be used as a standard base material in our specifications. Um, because quoting a number, it's, it's very it's very uh, dangerous because that number depends on the material. So it, you can get it easily equivalent to your normal G1, G2, G3 type of material that we are using in that regard. And in terms of the mixing in, in the field, um, you typically mix it in with a normal uh, water cart, obviously making sure how much water for what uh, type of section. And, and we normally work uh, around optimum moisture content and for our materials, again, it ranges quite a lot. Uh, we, we get a wide range depending on the uh, geological properties of the material, the percentage of clay component and so on. Um, but, but yes, you work with it like a normal uh, incorporating your moisture in your material before you start to compact it. Uh, we have a question by Anjali. Anjali, can you please uh, ask your question? Thanks, Isaac. Uh, thanks, Professor uh, Stain. I also want to commend your group for doing a cross-industry research. I think finding those mutual benefits um, from different industries is really critical. But my question is with the nano silane, um, and specifically your output or your outlook in how a local uh, government can be mobilized to use and invest on such advanced materials, even if the percentage, I think you had one or 1.5%. 1 Okay, so, so my understanding of your question is how can you get the local government guys to start to use it? Am I correct with yeah, that? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, um, that's a nice challenge. Uh, and especially because as, as civil engineers, we are pretty conservative people that say, listen, we've always done it like this. Uh, how, why do we need to change the, the formula? And why do we need to use this new material what is the benefit going to be? And it's, it's not a bad thing to do because we are trying to build roads that's going to be in a good condition for uh, a decade or two. So we should take the correct decision. The way that we normally do it locally <coughs> is that uh, the local government, the provincial government is part of that whole development. And typically like the, what you have seen with the heavy vehicle simulator test that we have done, we start in the laboratory and we prove in the laboratory that the, the benefits of the uh, stabilization actually takes this material from a marginal unacceptable condition to something similar to what we would normally use in a base material, for instance. Once we've got that support, then we try to move into the accelerated pavement testing uh, area where on an APT device or an APT section, you will build a specific section using normal equipment, get the construction right, and then you bring in your APT equipment to within a relatively short time, check whether that material that with its laboratory properties are similar to a, 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 a typical traditional material. Can that also withstand in the field when it's part of a pavement structure, where it's got certain support layers and a certain surface and so on, can it withstand those loads? And, and that's a very important part in the developments that we've done in South Africa for, for many decades, to, to have that proof of the concept part before you then go out and actually apply 
this in sm uh, small sections first, but then roll it out from there. And a process like that does not happen in a month's time. Obviously, it's a, it's a number of years, multi-year, multi-objective type of research program where you have to have the research on the one hand, and you've got to have the practical guys in the, in the local government on the other hand, understanding what you are doing. Uh, because if you, if you miss them and you are not clear on why the benefits are there and how they work, you easily miss them out and they say, well, this is not what we normally do. And, and then you've got a problem. Uh, Professor Arkadi. Yeah, uh, Venant, thank you so much. That was an excellent presentation and very informative. Uh, did you Thanks. in South Africa uh, try to use uh, the geopolymer for the stabilization? Uh, we, we, uh, we have done some sections with it. Um, I know Gerrit uh, Jordan, my, my colleague, have looked at it in some of the areas. I will I will not be able to tell you now exactly which ones and how many kilometers because it was still part of the initial work. Uh, but what we are currently doing, and, and that's I think where, where this will actually start to grow as part of our National Roads Agency research uh, effort. This is one of the aspects that we are really now drilling into uh, looking at the different types of, of nano stabilizers because there's again quite a range of them and trying to get a, a a guideline that at least provides some indication of these ones typically work with this group of soils, those ones work typically with those groups of soils. All right, thank you. Uh, we have uh, our last question. I'm sorry we won't be able to answer all of the, the questions due to time constrictions. We have the last question by Egeman. Can you, Egeman, please ask your question? Hi. Um, well, thank you Hi. very much for the presentation. Uh, well, I was just wondering how much water it takes to uh, will produce that material compared to the one that you save during construction. Um, I, I actually thought before the uh, lecture, I must just go and check again. One of our good engineering geologist uh, colleagues have done the calculation quite a while ago. So that's the one that we are using. I think we are looking at typically about 120,000 liters per, per layer, per standard layer per kilometer. Uh, but it's, it's something that one can calculate for your own road. Once you've got the percentage moisture and you've got the uh, uh, volume of that layer per kilometer, you can check it. But, but it's in the region of 120,000 liters uh, per kilometer. So, so the 40,000 liters that we save is, is making quite a bit of a difference. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Pleasure. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Stein, for, for, for your time and the knowledge that you shared with us. We really appreciate it. Uh, Isaac, it's a real pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity and for you guys taking part in it and asking questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Have a very good day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.